This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. This episode is brought to you by the team at The Real Soil Company. Launched to the market in 2020, The Real Soil Company proudly offers new organic peat-free supersoil. Packed full of organic nutrients for optimal plant health, Supersoil's natural boosters will stimulate quicker plant establishment and better resilience against pests and diseases, whilst also enabling edible crops to benefit from nutritional enhancement and a higher crop yield. The enhanced soil also offers better water retention and release for optimum plant growth, whilst providing a more balanced and workable material for gardeners. As a special offer for listeners, The Real Soil Company is offering 5% off all orders of its new supersoil throughout May and June 2021. Simply visit the link in the show notes and enter the code Roots and All 5, all uppercase, at the checkout. This week I'm speaking to Doug Beerend, journalist and author of In Search of Mycotopia, a book which documents Doug's journey of discovery as it pertains to the world of mushrooms. We talk about what sparked this journey, about what, as he puts it in the interview, was his come to mushroom moment, and about how his interest in fungi continues to develop with each new step he takes along the way. I began by asking Doug what prompted him to write the book. Um, Sure. Well, I started out, I'm a freelance writer and journalist for about a decade now, and I started out with an emphasis on technology and media um, and science. And in those areas, I think I was looking for some hope (laughs) regarding our degrading social and environmental situations. And quickly became pretty disillusioned with the discourse around technology and the sort of limits of that conversation to actually realize the change that people were talking about. And at that same moment, I happened upon a a TED talk of all things by uh, one Paul Stanitz, who's maybe the most uh, recognized mycologist in the world. Um, It was called Six Ways Mushrooms Can Save the World. And it was uh, just this sort of tour de force of applied mycology, the term that's used, um, using fungi to clean up oil spills and degrade plastic uh, to produce you know, food and medicine from agricultural waste, just all of these sort of mind-blowing um, applications of fungi. And that started me down the path, and I ended up interviewing him actually for a tech website, which is kind of funny. Um, but it was the beginning of a, a switch in my own uh awareness and and interest uh, away from technology and media and more toward just nature and um, food and food systems. And that got me to writing about those subjects, including several around this emerging community of some call them radical mycologists or DIY mycologists. But this uh, community of uh, non-institutional independent cultivators, tinkerers, people fascinated by fungi. And uh, a couple of articles I wrote about that subject uh, caught the eye of my publisher, now my publisher, uh, Chelsea Green, who suggested that maybe there was a book in it. And I agreed. So I proposed one. And uh, two years later, here we are. Yeah. So that's interesting, actually, what you said. Do, Do you feel that tech has limitations that the field of mycology doesn't? Yeah, well, I'm glad you're you're picking up on that thread because, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's it's about mycology specifically necessarily. Um, I mean, what I'm referring to really with that first bit is the just this the sort of legacy systems assumptions um, biases, like the same forces that have redounded to the the unequal distribution of resources currently. You know, a lot of people are talking about how mushrooms can provide food security and, and medicine security and clean up our waste and all this stuff. And I think uh, maybe that's an echo of that tech outlook, which which looks for solutions to problems rather than questioning the source of those problems. And I think with mycology and with fungi, there's there are a lot of facets to this, but basically it's this massive fundamental dimension of the natural world. It's like we walk into forests and imagine if we didn't see the plants or we didn't see the animals. We don't see the fungi, but they're just as prolific and important. And I think there's a sort of frame shattering uh, effect that comes from 
tuning into them and becoming aware of them and recognizing how they move and work in the world um, that lends itself to the communities, the, the attitudes that I'm seeing in the communities that are forming that are way more about reciprocity and sustainability than they are about extraction or innovation, even though those uh, attitudes and trends and, and forces are at play in the mycology space as well. I just think that there's a there's a, a perspective shift that's sort of inherent in coming into contact with that realm for so many of us who just grew up without it in our awareness or grew up with a positive aversion to it, um, that it, that it inspires new ways of thinking. Um, you know, it's a, a pretty broad statement, but it's, it's been what I've observed. Yeah. I certainly got the sense reading the book that the, 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 the realm of mycology is boundless. Um, but thinking about practical applications, um, what is the future of mycology in terms of research and education? I mean, you touched on some really interesting stuff in the book. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, like you said, it goes in all sorts of different directions. I mean, I think the, the various applications that we've alluded to are, are really interesting areas. There are companies like Ecovative and Microworks that are developing, um, really, uh, sophisticated, uh, substitutes for leather and, you know, construction materials, packing materials, synthetic meats, things like that. Um, which is all amazing. And I, I think I say in the book that it's probably even necessary, but I don't think it's sufficient, um, you know, for, for meeting the real needs of our time. I think those, those issues get a bit deeper. And to me, that's the most exciting thing about fungi is that they're bringing people together in these communities that are challenging the various stati quo, you know, and, and are, are questioning the deeper systems that are presenting the problems that we're all trying to solve. So, to me, what's what's really most promising about fungi is that they are offering opportunities for local economies, for sustainable, what they call loop closing um, systems in uh, agriculture, local agriculture. I mean, when it's a permaculture uh, concept, really, this loop closing thing where you're trying to take some output of a process and turn it into the input of another process. And that's really what fungi do in nature. And I think that people are, are increasingly recognizing that function. Um, or that suite of functions and are trying to leverage it in human systems. Um, so you can grow edible or medicinal mushrooms off of, you know, agricultural waste like straw, uh, coffee uh, husks or um, hulls, you know, things like that. So I think the more that people are finding those connections and those opportunities and, and are weaving them into, you know, their, their local agricultural systems or, or trying to start local economies around, you know, specialty mushrooms and things like that, it might inspire more, um, a broader, uh, expansion of that kind of those principles to, to other areas. In other words, it's not really about the mushrooms from where I sit. It's about something past them. They're, they're, they're more of an entree onto a bigger conversation. Yeah, you mentioned in the book about the um, mycelial networks being used as potential blueprints for societal organization. How would that work? Yeah, the mycelial metaphor, it's sort of inescapable once you're, you know, among the, uh, the fungally inclined. Um, it's a, uh, it's handy, you know, to think of, of fungi as a sort of example. I think there's reason to look to fungi for an example because they are among the oldest living things that we can, uh, observe these days. They've been around for billions of years. They, um, have, done so without uh, i mean they've evolved like crazy but but their basic function and form as this networked being that connects with the, the other life around them and forms larger networks of um i mean symbiosis is the term that's thrown around a lot sometimes they're pathogenic and parasitic you know they're opportunists just like every other living thing but they haven't uh been so at the expense of the ecosystems that they're part of and the environments on which they rely um, so there's a, you know, I think we humans could learn from that in a broad sense. Um, and I think that really fungi, what, if, if there's something to learn from their structure or ways of being, it's really, it's that they embody patterns. It's not that they are the pattern that we should replicate, that we should live like a fungus, but that they behave in ways that we should, we could learn from. And, uh, I think that message gets across really clearly to the people who study them. You know, they, they, again, because it's a, a form of life that most of us aren't familiar with, once we come to realize that they've, that how resilient and long lasting they are and that they've done it 
um, largely by being humble sort of facilitators of the ecosystems in which they are embedded. Um, that's a uh, that's a powerful message. Yeah, I wonder what came first, um, I, because I got the sense that the, the mycological community are really non non competitive and community minded. And actually, I wonder if they come to mycology because they are that way inclined, or whether they take that message on board once they get into it. That's a really good question. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's um, you know uh, it's it's probably. I mean, it's definitely a spectrum. There are def- there are people who, who see you know market opportunities around fungi, and that's why they're getting involved for sure. But yeah, I, th- I think it's either well, uh, you know, I think I mentioned this in the book as well. That to me, the the reason this is all be- uh, gaining so much steam and that so much interest is um, forming around fungi to me represents a, a broader sense that things need to change, <laughs> that our systems are failing us. That um, it's the unsustainability of the status quo is, is undeniable, and so we're looking for for answers and solutions. And I think you see a lot of that in the sort of applied mycology realm, you know, with these like mushrooms will save the world kind of uh, conversations. And uh, I think people are maybe starting to hone in on the the, the reality that the, the the we can't invent our way out of the problems we've invented our way into. Um, and that maybe there's there's something a bit more prosaic that we need to to address. And and I think just yeah, looking at a fungus and <laughs> considering the um, the role it plays and and uh, and comparing its its way of life and its longevity to to the path we're on. Um, yeah, it seems kind of inevitable. And I know it was definitely a path I followed, um, even though I was already sympathetic to these points of view. Um, Walking out into the woods and forming a relationship with a a form of life uh, that you you never really spent much time thinking about before is uh, transformative. So I tend to think it works both ways. You must have fa- felt like you'd had an absolute revelation when you found the field of mycology. You know, in view of the fact that you maybe were looking around for certainly to some extent or another answers and solutions that you weren't finding in your conventional life and career. Um, And I definitely get the sense of that as you wrote the book, um, that it just kind of opened up so many horizons for you. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, it was definitely revelatory. Um, And and you hear that a lot from people who, who find their way into this I mean, I I alluded to it before, but it's, it's really a pretty profound thing to, to, it's it's like recognizing animals for the first time or trees. It's on that scale, at least. Um, it's a, it's not quite as relatable as an animal because we're animals. You know, we can relate. Um, I, I don't. I, I think people are more inclined to have a stuffed teddy bear than a stuffed mushroom, but I guess that depends on who you hang out with. Um, the uh, the 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 perspective that you gain by uh, studying fungi is, is, yeah, I think by definition transformative just because of the, the, the scale of the gap it fills. Um, and it changes the, the feeling of being in the forest. Um, I mean, the book starts with my account of visiting this, uh, member of what's kind of unofficially, officially called the mycelium underground, this collective of kind of radical mycologists, um, in, uh, in the U S and, the the real moment come to come to mushroom moment for me was going into the woods with her and with her guidance as someone who who does this all the time and can really see mushrooms um i started to see them too and the the experience of the forest sort of lighting up with a, a layer of life that i just overlooked um literally overstepped you know for most of my life uh yeah this is definitely among the more profound moments of uh, re- realization uh, that I can remember. Yeah, you do get that definitely through reading the book. Um, thinking about the fact that mycology seems to be uh, democratic and, you know, it's more about the greater good. Um, it's really interesting how citizen science fits into that. Um, can you talk about that in terms of its relevance to the progression of mycology? Yeah. Um, I mean, institutional science in general is 
you know, suffering from uh, diminishing funding. Um, I, and this is true in the U.S. and in the U.K. as well. Um, you know, part of the book takes place in Kew uh, Gardens, where there's a, a massive mycology program, uh, the largest fungarium in the world. Um, I also visit a kind of equivalent or contrasting example here in the U.S. and Utah um, for the book. But in both cases, the uh, institution is carrying on its mycological research largely on the basis of amateur contributions. And I think that's a dynamic you're going to see more of. Um, it's fueled in part by that, you know, uh, catering, uh, cr- cratering funding, but it's also uh, a fact, uh, for, uh, function of developments in technology, both like DNA sequencing that people can can do at home, you know, literally carry in their pocket a DNA sequencer now. Um, it's, uh, social media has played a huge role because communities of interest are forming, um, and they're quite vibrant and. I think at the institutional level, you know, it's not like a different species of person becomes a professional mycologist versus one who stays a, you know, an amateur. And even that word has some some baggage. You know, people I think are trying to, to destigmatize it because it really does mean doing something out of love, which to me is hard to impeach. But the uh, those those are the basic forces I see the the broadening of um, access to tools and techniques and knowledge and community that are giving amateurs a lot more uh, force in that space and also just the need for that uh, sort of um, activity as institutions of science uh, lose their funding and lose the resources to do this work. And also the scale of the problem uh, that institutional mycology faces, that problem being uh, accounting for biodiversity, fungal biodiversity. It's um, it's vastly understudied. We we only know a small percentage of the uh, the mushrooms and fungi that are out there. So this huge project of documenting the fungi, which don't even produce mushrooms all the time. A lot of them live hidden in the cells of plants or underground, and we can only find them through genetic techniques. And so there's there's some special uh, aspects to the fungal um, life form. That, that are at play as well, and that again, technology is helping to to you know uh, un- uncover. But uh, yeah, I, I think that in the coming years, the the distinction between amateur and you know quote unquote real or professional scientists, uh, not to diminish their work, but I think the 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 two are going to become more entangled and less distinct. Um, and I think that's probably a good thing because uh, the more people who are enfranchised to do science, the the better the field becomes, the the more you know, the the more its work comes to represent the, the stakeholders. And you know, with science, that's basically everybody. Yeah, on that point, you cover some really interesting examples of amateur um, growers of mushrooms um, who are doing who are doing it on a small scale um, to to sell the mushrooms uh, for food. So that's really, I think, an interesting concept because it is. It is small scale. It's affordable generally to to start up, and the possibilities again are vast in terms of what you could grow and in terms of having a local market for the produce. I mean, can you see that industry developing into something you know that that is more commonplace? Yeah, I mean, I think that's happening. Uh, mushroom farms are are popping up certainly in the U.S. I I, I actually can't speak to the mushroom farm dynamic in the U.K. Um, I think there's uh, I think that the two on the two sides of the, the ocean, there, there's maybe a certain um, delay. I think a lot of the U.S. kind of microculture, based on the people I talk to in the UK, is, uh, is slowly percolating um, across the pond, as it were. And, and so um, maybe this will be the case over there as well. But certainly in the U.S., there is, uh, I mean, I hesitate to call it an explosion, but every day there's a new mushroom farm, you know, showing up and basically anywhere in, in this country you're within uh access of some small mushroom farm and as a model it makes sense because you know unlike button mushrooms uh cremini mushrooms uh which are manufactured at vast scales here in the u.s mostly in pennsylvania um these specialty mushrooms that are gaining popularity like oyster mushrooms maitake shiitake um although that one's a bit borderline because a lot of people already eat that um and, and many other mushrooms are not 
uh, as shelf stable. They just inherently uh, favor a local market. And I think that's the reason there's still a, a vibrant foraging market, um, in part because of the pr- uh, premium that's put on local and wild, but also um, because many of those mushrooms are difficult to cultivate. They only appeal to a relatively small uh, consumer base compared to like the, the mushrooms you t- tend to see on pizza, you know, which are, again, made at industrial scale. So there's some of that just inherent nature of the, the being that's at play. But also, I think it's, um, yeah, like you said, just so easy to do um, in principle. Uh, there's just some basic startup costs and some you know, considerations as far as the kinds of environments you can maintain. You know, if you live in a, an extreme environment, it might be a little harder to get the, the humidity and temperature uh, set up. But otherwise, it, it doesn't take much to, to start a productive mushroom farm. And in fact, you can get the, the source strains from any mushroom you find in the wild, you know, as long as you know what it is and you're, you're, uh, uh, you're skilled enough with the basic cultivation techniques. The person I mentioned earlier, Smugtown, um, I actually was visiting them recently and I, I brought back a bag of reishi mushroom that they produce. And it's from a strain that uh, Olga, the proprietor, plucked from a, a park near her house. And it's been going for thousands of generations since that. Um, so it's uh, there's, there's a lot of local uh, or, or locality kind of baked into to fungi. Uh, and and I think that that extends to cultivating them. Yeah, it's it's interesting as well. Talk, uh, thinking about the 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 brewing company with their uh, you know the mm. kind of terroir when it comes to the um, <laughs> yeah, the fungi, um, which actually brings me on to nicely to another question which I was going to put in, which is: Are you now growing your own mushrooms at home? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I am actually. And, and I wouldn't, I'd hesitate to call them my own because they all came from Smugtown, this uh, company I just mentioned. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've got five bags of, uh, what look like, uh, what, well, it look like what they are fungus <laughs> on my uh, fireplace right now. Um, and that's honestly the, the best way I could encourage one of the best ways I could encourage anyone who's at all interested in this. If, if you have access to a, a mushroom farm that can provide you a grow block or a, a do-it-yourself growing kit. Um, I highly recommend it because it's a it's a incredible way to get familiar with this um, quite unfamiliar form of life. Um, that or go into the woods with a with someone who's uh, you know, experienced and, and can can open your eyes to to that dimension of the of the woods. Yeah, um, going back s- slightly a step back to the, again to the practical considerations, um, I did want to just touch on how mushrooms can help improve soil because, um, obviously this is a podcast for gardeners and gardeners love a bit of soil. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, could you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I mean, in the, in the most general terms, um, you know, the function of fungi is in large part the formation of soil. Um, so it just stands to reason that, that one would uh, probably want to encourage uh, soil uh, enhancing fungi in their gardens. Um, I think there are people who can speak much better to like the strains and uh, you know species that that one might prefer um, depending on the kinds of gardens they're operating or if they're using permacultural principles. You know there are many resources for that. Um, a, a simple Google search away, but. Uh, in terms of the function of fungi in soil, it's it's quite uh, quite fundamental, and it includes producing uh, reducing erosion just by giving it physical structure, um, by distributing nutrients. Um, that's really its main function. It, it absorbs and transports nutrients throughout its body, which end up uh, affecting all of the soil to which it connects. Um, they obviously they produce mushrooms, which can be a value add, you know, for anyone who is uh, producing food from their garden. Um, but it's a, uh, I mean, it's a fundamental aspect of any soil ecology. Um, fungi are as important as any other being. and They're the egg and the cake, as uh, one mycologist put it to me. And so there are, I think, plenty of Resources for inoculating one's gardens it depends on if you're using wood chips and what you know you're going to want some kind of wood rotter probably for that. Um, 
Astropharia are very common, like uh, wine caps. Those are pretty popular, uh, these garden bed enhancers. But uh, yeah, I think the I think it's also largely an untapped um, area because you know so many, so much of our tradition around food is is the the reduction of fungi, the uh, the elimination of molds, and that's often a good thing. But sometimes it might redound to a an aversion to fungi where it really might actually do better to invite them. So I think there's probably going to be a lot of uh, innovation around working fungi into to garden spaces. And I'm personally very excited to see how that goes. Yeah, definitely. I've interviewed a couple of people who are researching uh, mycorrhizal fungi. So yes, it, it does sound like a really interesting uh, field. Um, I was My last question is, um, as I was speaking to you, I realized that actually a lot of the questions that I had prepared for you it's kind of tended towards asking what mushrooms can do for us. But then as I listened to mm. you speak, I thought, is there anything that we can do for mushrooms or are they, you know, do they not need our help? Are they way beyond us in terms of evolution? <laughs> I love that question. Um, yeah, I mean, they don't need our help, I don't think. Um, uh, and, and it's hard to say because like we alluded to before, the we just don't even know what's out there as far as fungi. So we can't even really get a, a, a good sense of, you know, what we're losing to habitat loss and climate change. Um, and and I, I noticed myself using the word we're losing, you know, because, yeah, it's from a human perspective. And I, I tend to assess any question about like uh, saving the world or, uh, you know, um, preventing a climate catastrophe and all in terms like that like we're always talking about i think whether it's going to help uh, humans survive you know like if in a world where there are no humans there's no no one to really care about what nature what course nature takes and so um you know in that sense i think nature fungi they've been around they'll be fine no matter what happens to us um but if we want to see a future where we will be around to appreciate it um, I think we need to think about how to partner with fungi and the rest of the natural world. Um, and yeah, I think, I think decentering ourselves, uh, from the picture is, is useful insofar as it recognizes that we're not the center of the picture, but, um, we also need to be, I don't think we can be cavalier about, um, you know, uh, just letting nature do what it's going to do because it might, uh, it might not have our, you know, future in mind the way that we do. So. I guess that's a long way of saying that um, I think coming to recognize the fungal dimension of life is part of a broader, um, in, in my view, a broader uh, move to just recognize life in general and our part in it. And, you know, uh, I think there are a lot of practices built into mycology, certainly in the more traditional sense. You know, there, for example, people will, when they pick a mushroom, they'll, they'll make sure to use a, a wicker bag so that spores uh, follow, you know, where they walk and they're helping to propagate the organism that they appreciate. And those sorts of noticing practices and appreciative practices, while small, I think can be, um, can, can end up benefiting us all if, if they're more widespread and just taken for granted. But we respect the organisms we encounter in, in nature. We recognize our connection to them and dependence on them. Um, and that's something I'm seeing in these communities that I document in the book. And so I, 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 I guess part of my project here is trying to help amplify that and, and those values that I see as uh, uh, you know, valuable and good and also necessary. And uh, so, yeah, I guess to say, like, what can we do for the fungi? Um, yeah, my, my answer is to recognize them and respect them. And in so doing, recognize and respect everything to which they connect, which is, as it turns out, the rest of the natural world. My apologies if you're new to Roots and All and you tuned in expecting to hear how to keep black fly off your broad beans. And you're met instead with discussions about our very existence. If you like this kind of thing, though, Welcome to the band of enlightened gardeners who realise that what they're doing makes a difference in the world. Thank you for listening and supporting the podcast, and thanks to Doug for this fabulous interview. I hope you will go and check out his book. And please also go and check out the episode sponsors, The Real Soil Company. They're offering 5% off all orders of their new super soil throughout May and June 2021. 
Simply visit the link in the show notes and enter the code ROOTS and ALL5, all uppercase, at the checkout. Now here's Dr. Ian Bedford talking about one of my favourite pollinators. Hoverflies are a fascinating group of insects that are commonly seen visiting flowers within our gardens, where they feed on nectar and pollen. There's over 280 recognised species of hoverfly in Britain, and as their name suggests, they're perfectionists in the art of hovering. Hoverflies belong to the insect order of true flies, the dipterans, and as such, only have two wings. In most cases, they have brightly coloured bodies, displaying bands, spots and stripes of yellow, orange, black and brown. And for protection from birds, they've evolved to look remarkably similar to their four-winged cousins, the wasps and the bees. But they can't sting and are totally harmless. Hoverflies are, though, very important beneficial insects for our gardens, since they effectively pollinate plants whilst they feed within the flowers. And the larvae of some of the more common species are voracious predators of aphids. Carefully look at an aphid colony on a rose bush, for example, and you're very likely to see the maggot like larvae of hoverflies catching aphids, raising them in the air as they suck them dry before tossing aside the empty carcass. It can be a tough life for many in the bug world. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.